All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Christina, and I am a reporter with Chalkbeat New York. We're a nonprofit news organization that covers education across the country. Um, and you are at the Campaign for Children's Virtual Speakout. In case you hadn't noticed, there is an election going on in New York City to pick our next mayor. And we're here tonight for a few reasons. Uh, Chalkbeat and the advocates at Campaign for Children want to make sure that the important issues affecting families uh, are put on the map in this election, whether that's affordable childcare or access to summer programs. We're also here to flip the script a little bit on a typical mayoral forum. Instead of hearing from the candidates tonight, we want to hear from you. This is a speak out. So tell us, what are the strengths of the system? What needs to get better? We'll be sharing a recording of tonight's um, meeting with the candidates, and we also invited them to listen in. Hopefully they're in the audience. Uh, I'll also be interviewing uh, many of the candidates and we'll post videos of those interviews um, so that you can hear directly what they had to say. Um, there's lots of good stuff in there. We had a bunch today about uh, how quickly folks wanna get to pay parity, um, who thinks that universal access to extended um, school day and school uh, year care uh, should be universal. So check us out on Chalkbeat's website. They'll be up soon. Um, Chalkbeat will also have a survey that uh, we'll invite you guys to fill out just to tell us more about what you want to see front and center during the race. Um, so more about tonight. Um, we'll hear about how the pandemic has affected youth services and what the next mayor needs to do to make sure that families and children are supported. Um, and then we'll have a we'll hear from Jennifer March about that. And then we'll have a panel discussion with people on the ground who are making the system work and who are benefiting from programs and services that are being offered right now. And they'll speak to what more families like them need. So, and this is a speak out. We want to hear from you. So please use the chat function for comments and ideas. It's being monitored. And you can also use the Q&A function of the chat to pose questions when you have them. And so now we turn it to Jennifer March, um, who's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, the platform um, going into the next mayoral election that advocates um, wanna see get accomplished and share a little bit about the impact that the pandemic has had on youth and families. So Jennifer, take it away. Thank you. So as Christina said, I'm Jennifer March. I'm the executive director of Citizens Committee for Children and we're a member of the steering committee of the Campaign for Children. As many of you joining us tonight might recall, the Campaign for Children is a citywide coalition of over 150 organizations. And for over a decade, we've worked together fighting to protect and expand funding for childcare, after school, and, and summer programs in the city's budget, and to advance efforts that have led to the expansion of universal pre-K and now 3K, middle school, after school, as well as help create a path to salary parity in the early education workforce. And we've repeatedly made summer programming possible. Our work together is ever more important as we must ensure that existing and incoming city leaders prioritize the needs of children, youth and families and the programs that serve them. The past year has profoundly impacted New York City. Children and families have experienced loss of loved ones, disruption in education, heightened housing, income and food insecurity, social isolation, grief, and heightened behavioral health needs. And all of these factors are disproportionately falling on those who were burdened by deep disparities prior to the pandemic. At the forefront of this crisis, early care and education and youth service providers have been meeting the needs of children and families. And tonight, we are keeping these needs front and center and thinking about the future and the road to recovery. We know that more must be done to make childcare more affordable, especially for families with infants and children. The annual cost of center-based childcare alone for low-income families with children under five can consume up to 65% of their income. We know that summer youth programs like camps and SYEP have been historically underfunded and the challenges of the school year have only heightened the need for year-round youth supports. Furthermore, we know that the one-time nature of this summer's Summer Rising initiative 
underscores the need for a multi-year universal approach to youth programming that includes summer. The next mayoral administration, the incoming city council and other city leaders face a unique opportunity to advance a transformative policy agenda that will ensure that children and families have access to the programs needed to support their recovery and moreover combat long-standing disparities and build a more equitable educational continuum. Last month, the Campaign for Children released the 2021 policy platform that outlines a series of actions that mayoral candidates and the next group of city leaders must prioritize to achieve this goal. The platform details the opportunity and urgency for meaningful investments in children and youth through universal access to full day, year round early care and education, comprehensive salary parity in the sector, and expanded access to after school and summer programming, including summer youth employment. The platform outlines ways to strengthen the community-based organizations themselves and also promote innovation. If the past year has shown us anything, it has shown us the ability and willingness of early care and youth service sector providers to step up in times of crisis. Early childhood centers pivoted to teach young children essential developmental skills remotely, to engage with parents to help kids learn at home, and many family childcare providers stayed open during the peak of a deadly pandemic to ensure that essential workers had someone to care for their children. Meanwhile, youth service programs connected families to food resources, health supports, quickly helped to bridge the digital divide for families and students left behind by the city's pivot to remote learning, as well as provided critical safe spaces to learn through rec centers and learning labs. Most of all, early care and education and youth service workers kept New York City's children and youth engaged, happy and learning. During a time of so much loss and anxiety, they also helped to promote connectivity, resiliency and healing. Fortunately, the early care and education and youth service sectors continue to be ready and willing to step up and respond to the needs of communities. These providers are the backbone of the Campaign for Children and have been staunch advocates rallying against budget cuts on the steps of City Hall and now on Zoom and critically engaging youth and parents that are here with us tonight in conversations about policy, advocacy, and the future. So I just wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening and a big shout out to our partners at Chalkbeat and Christina Vega. And I look forward to listening to all of you and to the advocacy that we're gonna to do together moving forward. So thank you. Thank you for setting us up um, for the discussion now that we'll have with our panelists. Um, you're gonna wanna hear what these guys have to say. They're dedicated and they know their stuff. Uh, so we have Betty Baez Mello, who is the Early Education, Early Childhood Education Project Director at Advocates for Children. And that means that she makes sure that really little New Yorkers from ages birth, uh, from ages birth to five who have disabilities are getting the education and support they need and deserve. We have Sandino Sanchez, who is Director of the Teen Workforce Development at Children's Aid. Uh, we have Madison Valerio, who's a high school freshman in the Bronx, and she's benefited from after school care programs like salsa dance lessons and has even hosted a rally to make sure that New York City students have access to summer programming. We'll also hear from Janine Wilson, uh, who's the mom of three boys uh, in the Bronx, uh, one of whom has become a chef thanks to after school programming um, offered through Good Shepherd Services, and, um, and her boys have all benefited from mentoring and role models that they've been able to meet through, um, through those services. And we have Michelle Page, who's the Associate Executive Director of Early Childhood Programs at University Settlement. And that means that she oversees all kinds of programs and services for young children, from home visiting programs to mental health supports to early head start. So we're gonna kick it off. And gentle reminder to our panelists about three minutes each, because we want to make sure we get to everyone and also to the questions that I hope um, our chat is full of right now. So I want to start with Michelle. Um, there's been a lot of focus on making sure that the early childhood workforce is paid fairly and equally to the K-12 workforce. And so 
there were there was a lot of movement on this uh, recently. So I'd love to hear where do things stand now and what is needed moving forward. And um, and also I want to turn to children under the age of three, if you can talk about what you hope the next mayor will do for those kids. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, especially during Teacher Appreciation Week. I think it's just a very relevant conversation to have in this moment. Um, while New York City has made some significant strides in getting early childhood workforce uh, closer to pay parity, I think that we have some opportunity to think about the next year moving forward. We have um, several union contracts that need to be uh, re-examined and looked at, especially starting in the fall where the last set of pay parity increases will take effect. And at the next, the end of the next program year, we have to start thinking about what salaries are very commensurate to the work that we've done in the workforce. You know, during the pandemic, there was lots of very um, appropriate and deserved praise of appreciation of teachers. <clears throat> and my concern is that that appreciation will diminish as we have the real conversations on how do you compensate people who, as Jennifer said, did not close, but really were sitting in the moment and pivoted their programs to stay open and service is throughout the city. I think it's time for us to really start thinking about that. I think the candidates also need to think about not segregating the conversation of early childhood professionals. You know, teachers of UPK, teachers of toddlers, teachers of three-year-olds. The conversation has started to come apart and treating these people in isolation. And it's really an opportunity for us to look at the workforce as a whole. And then the last thing, I know you uh, asked a question about our younger children, children under three. I think we need to pay special attention to the social, emotional, developmental milestones that may have been missed for children who are not engaged actively on a day-to-day -day basis with other children in either home-based programs or center-based programs. You know, we at University of Settlement uh, are gearing up to be prepared to support those children in a to totally and completely different way in anticipation of this deficit. So thank you again for having me. We, we've asked the mayoral candidates about these issues, so stay tuned again for our interviews coming soon. Uh, Sandino, I want to ask you, um, so the city right now is expecting an influx of federal stimulus dollars, and with that comes opportunity to make universal programs, um, youth services programs, and make them year-round, um, and to maybe finally end this budget dance that advocates talk about every year where they have to go to City Hall and fight um, to get included in the budget. And so I'd love to hear from you. Um, what have you seen, in your experience, what kinds of immediate and long-term supports do you think young people need to help them recover from the year and, and a half that we've been through? Uh, thank you uh, for having me today. I think that that would be fantastic. I think for many, many years, and I've been doing this for quite some time, and it always, it is always, the budget process always is painful to me because we all, I think, agree that young people should always be you know, first, especially when it comes to resources and, and, and budgets. For starters, I, I, we are, I think, in the best city in the world. I think we agree that every teenager interested and eligible for work should have an opportunity for work. We know that work alone isn't enough. We know that our teens need the support and training to be successful, uh, not only for social and emotional, but also their skills development and the work readiness that is included in what they do. We also know that our families continue to be burdened with low paying jobs or loss of income due to COVID. To get our city back on track will require strategy that includes training the next workforce. Those are our young people, the teenagers. Uh, if, if we put them in the front of our plans, we will have a brighter future. If we, if we look at our existing partnerships in our schools and our communities and our NYCHA development, there's already a network of organizations working with young people year round. This would only give them the support and the resources they need in order to prepare young people, 
not necessarily for this summer, for next summer and the summer beyond. A job isn't just a summer job. It should be looked at as an opportunity to train young people year round. SYP as it is, is the largest, is probably the largest workforce development strategy in the world. It can become even better if we all work together with more resources to make sure that again, the future of our city and our nation are put first, not just training them for jobs, but training them for careers and training them for a better future. With supports from the stimulus funding that we anticipate, we can expand immediately to universal SYP, making every young person eligible to have an opportunity, not just as a summer job, but an opportunity during the year. This will come with resources that they need to, to learn, to grow, and to earn some money. If every business, every nonprofit, every association, both public and private, if they all took in some of these interns and created a program that supported, we could do this from one day to the next. With the right incentives, I think that even large franchises and corporations can, can not only incorporate this, but merge this with whatever internship they have already in place to make this just a broader, greater program for all. Right now, we have a, about 150,000 young people that would love to work this summer, but they won't because there's only 75,000 opportunities for them. And I use the term young person loosely. We know that there are between the ages of 14 and 20. For some of them, if we expand it even more, there's probably even more people that can participate and can benefit from this. CBOs working with the teens can immediately start identifying and creating supports that the teens will need to be successful. This could be done overnight. It will be hard, but it, if we all work together, it can be done over, over time. Ultimately, we have a unique opportunity in New York City to train and develop the next workforce and pave the way to true COVID recovery using an int intentional year round and workforce development efforts. We know that our families are struggling. They've suffered uh, income loss. They, they've suffered underemployment and low wages. We have to look at this strategy in the road to recovery, including our young people, because together our young people with their families will be a brighter future for New York City. Thank you. Put the young people to work. Um, okay, so now we're going to turn to Madison. Um, I'm so excited to have you on the panel. I would love to hear from you just what the pandemic has been like for you and what kinds of supports have been available or not available that you think would be useful and that you would like to see the next mayor really focus on. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for having me. I wanted to talk. So like um, Christina said, Overall, the pandemic has been a downhill for everyone. We got caught off guard, we weren't prepared, um, basically just got thrown at us. So it wasn't, it was very tough, especially from my eighth grade year. I am a freshman, a ninth grader. So before when the pandemic hit, I was an eighth grader. And overall, mentally, physically, emotionally, drained and confused and I went from going outside and seeing my friends every day and learning in person with my teachers and communicating to just staying in one spot at home and seeing teachers through a screen so it was a drastic change and like I said we were not prepared for it um I would also like to say I, the transition wasn't any easier any easier and I went from a building that I was in since the second grade because there's an elementary school and middle school it's Crescent Academy um I went from a building to where I was comfortable with everyone knew all the staff cool with everyone um to a building where I knew no one and the thing is everybody knows that your ninth grade year is more like a welcoming to your first four years of high school but it was even less of a support because of the pandemic. So overall, the activities that I would like are, and I wanna go back on my eighth grade year in like Good Shepherd overall. This is an after school program um, that helped me a lot and helped me be the well-rounded person I am today. And 
the just the activities that they had there, such as dance, sports, fashion, theater, um, um, music, awesome music, and glee. So all of that was like the biggest outlet and it was free. So that was even better. It was the outlet that I can always reach on and something I can count on. And when that all left, it's like, where do I go now? Where do I express myself? I don't know what to turn to. So I just think overall, us students and us children need somewhere to feel safe, secure, comfortable, supported, um, recognized, recognized because we a lot like me personally, I express myself through dance, through arts and crafts and just getting something on a paper or even expressing it. And I feel like if there's a secure, safe space for that, so many students and children are going to progress upward. So overall, just a program and a program that has to do with like going outside and activities outside, because I feel like during this pandemic, it was in our homes. And overall, I just feel like we need just fresh air and to breathe outside and see nature and get comfortable again. So overall, as a student, I am asking for the next mayor to have activities that are good for our mental health, physical health, emotional health, just our health overall, and we need to prioritize it. Thank you for having me. So it sounds like you're craving social connections, outlets to express yourself, and to please let us get out of this lockdown and get outside and see the sky. That all makes perfect sense. Uh, I'm going to pause here in the panel discussion and turn it to all of you guys in the audience. I think we have a pop-up poll question for you guys. So get ready to vote. Um, so here's our question. What do you want the next mayor of New York City to do to support child care for families in New York City? So please cast your vote. Be counted. Let us know what you think. And while you guys are voting, I think I want to turn really quickly to um, either Michelle or Betty. Uh, we had a question. Um, I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, we had a question from the audience. Can you elaborate on what parity means and what the work um, that the next mayor will have to do to prioritize that to make it a reality? So sorry, sometimes we talk about these things like everyone knows what we're talking about. But what, what is pay parity and what could the mayor actually do about that? Or I, I could start and then Betty could also chime, <clears throat> chime in as well. You know, when we talk about parity, we're really talking about looking at the workforces across the city that are doing similar jobs, have similar requirements and comparing their salaries. The push for parity was really the comparison of early childhood educators to the educators in elementary schools and public school system across New York City. And if you compared the hours worked, days worked, um, plus the qualifications, which are the same, which is the certification to be a teacher, and you compared the salaries, they were very disproportionate to the disadvantage of the early childhood workforce. So advocates, some of them on this panel and throughout the city really pushed um, the administration of New York City to really look at how underpaid early childhood employees were in this system with the expectation that they had the same qualifications to do the job. Um, and we did make strides in the last round of negotiations a couple of years ago, but that contract is going to be coming up soon and we need to restart that conversation to make sure that the conversation is understood that it was just the beginning and not the ending and that we really need to acknowledge the work that early childhood educators and the support staff and early childhood mental health uh, therapists and everything that makes this workforce important and critical to the work, we need to make sure that they're compensated correctly. And I also wanna add that I think that loan forgiveness um, should be part of that conversation. And I know that's you know a higher level conversation to have, but I think that needs to be part of the conversation as well. 
It's always striking to me as a reporter to learn about teachers in the same, at the same site, you know, essentially providing the same service services, sometimes in the same classroom, earning vastly different salaries just because of the funding structure and the kind of patchwork way that we um, fund early childhood services. Um, so thanks for clarifying that. Do we have the poll results to share? Here they are. Okay, everything. It's all important. Do it all. Do it quickly. So I think we have a part two of this question too. Um, so if there was something on that list that um, that you didn't see that you think the next mayor needs to do to support child care for families, please put it in the chat. And while you guys are sharing your responses, I want to turn back to our panelists. And I want to hear from Janine, who's a mom of three. Um, I'd love to hear how, as a parent, um, how some of the youth programs like after school have been helpful for you and for your sons. What is the impact on your family? Hi, everyone. Um, well, all, I have three sons and all of my children participated in an after school and summer school free of course, which was, I think one of the best thing for a parent, a single parent, low income as well. Um, however, the after school program is more than just a program for me. It's a program where my children can gain social skills, constructive activities, and academic skills. It's, it's a combination of, of, of many things, as well as not only being a mom of three, but a parent leader for my children, for other children, wanting to see the mayor stand up that's coming in office to make these changes. Because statistics have shown that when a child, especially uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers when they don't have activities, constructive activities to keep them involved, then they can make bad choices. And those bad choices most likely is the street. So for to avoid these things and to make these changes, I wanna see that the program that my children has benefited from continue to stand and not only stand, but to develop, to grow, to be become bigger, to not have to worry if, um, are we gonna have the program next year? It, I wanna know that the program is available at all times. I have an, a high schooler now, and I have to go back with Mr. Sandino, because he highlighted something that touched me because I'm affected by this. I have a high schooler. He applied for summer youth and program. And he's so, he just, he, he believes he got the job. And I'm in the background just like, Lord, please let him be one of those children that's selected. Because if he's not, then I have to go other places as well as I have to now, you know, remind him that because he's not picked, that doesn't mean that he's less than. It's just a lottery. It should not just be a lottery. It should be an opportunity. It shouldn't just stop at pre-K or, or um, elementary, middle school. No, I wanna see the programs for my children, for our children, for our community to be permanent, for us to depend on, because we depend on these programs. We depend on these people who run these programs that they show our children and give them the skills so that they, they can become productive citizens in the future. Thank you for having me. So I wanna highlight kind of along those same lines um, as Janine was talking about, about the availability of these programs and how important um, it is that they're available when parents and families actually need them. Uh, we've got a comment in the chat about cuts to um, an early child care center at Lincoln Square. Uh, the parent is saying, I'm at an absolute loss. Uh, that they received an email that funding to the school has been cut and it looks like summer and extended day programs are no longer available. Now, meanwhile, parents have already signed up um, for their schools. So um, it's probably gonna change a lot of plans for a lot of folks. Um, and this person is saying, all I've heard over the past 12 months is how making childcare in this city more affordable 
is how it's important to make childcare in the city more affordable, yet you took away our option. Um, so that is powerful um, to hear directly from folks who, um, who need these services. Thank you for sharing that. I wanna to turn to Betty. Um, so the pandemic has been really hard for all of us, but students with disabilities um, have faced some particularly tall hurdles. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, how can the city support its youngest learners who have special needs um, in early childhood programs in the aftermath of the pandemic? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for hosting and, and for inviting us to be here and for taking the time to talk about young students with developmental delays and disabilities. Um, you know, even before the pandemic, I've been working with families who've been experiencing challenges getting services for children from birth to three in early intervention and for children three to five in preschool special education. And there have been kind of backlogs or challenges all along the way, including delays in evaluations, delays in finding providers. And that really causes children to go without crucial developmental and special education services at a time when it could really have the most impact. And then unfortunately, we've seen a lot of the burden or these challenges really fall on low income families, families who speak languages other than English and families of color. Um, so there definitely were a lot of longstanding challenges, um, and unfortunately, a lot of them were made worse by the pandemic. Among other things, during the last year, far fewer children were identified as having a developmental delay and disability, um, meaning that those children were never connected to early intervention and preschool special education services. Um, and so city numbers show that there were thousands of children who missed out on these interventions. Even the children who had been already connected to these services went with weeks and sometimes months without receiving the services that they needed um, for a variety of reasons, including you know, potentially lack of technology um, or the parent's inability to participate in sessions with the child. Um, and we also saw that children who were getting sessions, um, you know, remote services just weren't as effective for children, especially children with significant delays who weren't able to engage with a provider through their laptop, through a screen, right? It's very different to have your physical therapist and occupational therapist sitting next to you, holding your hand, helping you grasp coins, helping you hold a crayon, than it is to be getting that information through a screen. Um, and especially for young children, they need so much support from their parents to help them engage. And not all families have the capacity to participate in those sessions to do modeling, to prompt their child and really help them benefit from the services. So what does that mean for the next mayor? What like concrete steps could they take? Does that mean, you know, putting more resources into identifying children who may have disabilities, who may be entitled to an IEP? Like what would you want the next mayor to do to address this? Yep, there are lots of things for the new mayor to do. We, we can share laundry lists. Um, but some of them, yes, as you mentioned, you know, part of it is ensuring that this current administration has made huge investments in 3K and pre-K for all. Um, but unfortunately, it hasn't been able to ensure that young children with developmental delays and disabilities have equal access to these early and high quality childhood education programs. So we want the next administration to really focus on ensuring that children with disabilities are included in these, in these programs, right? So that they're designed with young children with disabilities in mind, um, and it's really creating an inclusive early childhood education program. So any new program, including extended childcare, should take these children's needs into consideration. And as you mentioned, it's very important to ensure that um, evaluations and services are provided in a timely manner. Um, there are legal requirements for when these services should be provided, and unfortunately, we've seen that the city has you know, violated these timelines again and again. Uh, and, you know, as the city is, is talking about expanding early childhood education to include, to provide a seat for every three and four year old in a preschool by September, 2023, that plan needs to take children with disabilities into account so that they're providing enough services and support to 3K and pre-K programs so that they can support children with developmental delays and disabilities. 
um, you know, we're glad to see that the city's already proposing some plans um, in the budget for things like inclusion specialists to work with the programs on how to support students with disabilities and also open some more integrated classes so that children with disabilities can, long, can learn alongside their typically developing peers. Um, but there are a lot of crucial needs, um, particularly for children with really significant developmental delays and disabilities who cannot access 3K and pre-K and who need a preschool special education program. Um, these programs have a special education teacher, they're smaller, they're more supportive, um, and it has staff that are really trained on working with students with disabilities. Um, you know, unfortunately, even before the pandemic, we saw that there was a huge shortage where last year the city was reporting that they needed at least or more than a thousand seats um, for spring of 2020 in order to serve all the students who needed a preschool special class program. There's gonna be funding in the city budget um, for these for more classes in the upcoming year, um, but these changes don't take effect until the 2020-2023 school year. And that's when the new mayor will have already taken office. Um, so we want the mayor to use the funds that are allocated in the budget to open more seats in preschool special classes and also to really support uh, the community-based organizations that run these programs. Part of that funding should go to salary parity. Um, thank you, Michelle, for going, giving kind of that great overview of what parity means. Um, preschool special education teachers at community-based organizations that provide preschool special education programs were not included even in those initial agreements that Michelle referred to. So now they're some of the lowest paying teachers in the city, even, they, even though they work with New York City's most vulnerable children. So it's really important to bring the salary for those teachers up so that these programs can continue to support children who need these seats. So if uh, the candidates are out there listening, I hope they were jotting all <laughs> down because that's, that's a long list. Um, and yeah, I can't, I mean, in talking to advocates, talking to parents, I hear all the time, you know, pre-K is not universal, not for kids who have disabilities. And it's a really striking um, divide uh, that we see in the city, even as, you know, the mayor is out there saying that we have universal pre-K. So I want to turn to, I think we have another, another poll question for you guys. Um, so here it is. What do you want the next mayor to do to support youth development programs in New York City? And I'm gonna see if we've got more. Oh my goodness, we have so many comments. This is awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. Okay, so um, let's see. We have someone who wants to talk about trauma. Um, so let's see, we can no longer tolerate academic disparities our communities face. Um, this includes trauma related issues. Um, oh, this is, this is a comment that has all kinds of things in it. Okay, too few, too few students are enrolling in post-secondary programs. Um, and those who graduate don't come out with skills that employers need. So I don't know, Sandina, do you wanna to speak to making sure that uh, children, that students are graduating with skills that are relevant in the workforce? So uh, what, over the years, one of the things that we have noticed is that even if a student graduates from high school, graduates from college, their resume can pretty much be empty. So it just doesn't apply to just high schoolers or or students that for whatever reason can graduate, we all they all have the same thing in common that they throughout their youthfulness, if that's a word, that they have not been able to develop a resume. So we try to teach young people early on that they can start working on a resume by looking at their life differently, volunteer work, stuff like that. But it is essential that everything that young people do can be put on a resume. One of the things that we're doing this summer is to create credentialing, professional development, so that even if they don't get a workplace experience, they could put something solid. So when they do graduate from high school, graduate from college, they have a resume that they can compete with. The other thing also is that there are career specific things that young people could do while they're in college or while they're in high school that can help them propel them to their career. And those that's those areas are also underfunded. 
because we're not we're not oftentimes we're just thinking of young people when they graduate from high school or they graduate from college but we don't do much to make sure that whatever career track they're on it's supported not just emotionally but also supported by professional development thank you so do we have the poll results Here they are. Ooh, after school and summer camp programs seem to be high up on the list, but also again, all of the above. Um, so let's see if anyone else has comments about uh, summer school. And okay, here, this might be another one for you, Sandino. As we focus on youth, what thoughts are being considered towards providing additional access to recreational centers for children and youth? Well, the, the, the ideal would be that every every uh, every gym internal, in-house or outside, every park is open, that everything. We know that young people, if you look at adults that are successful, you know that at some point they played a sport, they had uh, caring adults with them, they had folks around them that didn't give up on them and then kind of help them propel them into their future. And the same thing. Is, is about physical uh, activity and fitness. That's very important so that every able center, whether it's a church, whether it's a school, whether it's a community center should be able to be open for young people when they need it, which is when they're not in school and during their vacation time and particularly in the summer. Um, I wanna add that if there were actions that were not listed in the choices in the poll, please put them in the chat, answer what, what you want the next mayor to do to support youth services in New York City. Um, we have lots and lots of folks talking about pay parity. So this one is from Lois Lee. I wanted to advocate for assistant teachers in early childhood centers and community-based organizations. They're only paid $17 an hour with over 10 years of service and bachelor's and master's degrees. They run the class when the lead teacher is out, even with a sub there because they know the teacher and the, the children and the class routines. Pay parity should be equal to the salaries of paraprofessionals in public schools. Our assistant teachers make less than $30,000 and can't afford to live on that. They have to choose between buying food or paying rent. One assistant teacher was eating just the school meals so she could pay rent. Pay rent. So Betty, Michelle, do you guys want to talk about, again, like who should we be thinking about when we're talking about pushing for, um, for pay parity and for just a decent living for the people, many of them women of color who are working in our early childhood centers? Sure, I, I think it's the entire workforce. It, you know, I, I think people automatically start speaking of and refer to the teacher's parity but it's the entire workforce. It's the assistant teachers, it's the teacher's aides, it's the custodians and the cooks and the family service staff and the instructional coaches and the list goes on and on. It's the whole infrastructure of the workforce. Um, you can't lift salaries for one job title and not consider the others. It's a cohesive workforce. It's a cohesive system that needs to be addressed. One of the things that definitely is missing from the workforce for early childhood educators and the entire staff that is happening in other, you know, workforces, including elementary school teachers and other, you know, um, professionals, I know paraprofessionals was brought up as well, is that there's no real salary steps, you know, there's some kind of incremental salary increase for um, staff in other workforce um, settings, but that does not happen uh, for the early childhood folks. So we have to wait for something to be negotiated. Whereas other workforces have these incremental steps built into their contracts. That's definitely something that keeps broadening that gap of pay inequity. So that's something that needs to be really uh, looked at. We need to look at our family child care providers. Um, you know, they're independent um, small businesses and they need to be compensated so that they can continue to run these beautifully nurturing, safe programs for our youngest children in the city. And until you have the conversation of 
the workforce as a whole and stop segregating. Segregating for me is the word that just keeps coming to top of mind when we're talking about these new um, initiatives. Talk about what's going to happen for 3K. You're going to talk about what's happening for 4K. It's a separate conversation for toddler. But in fact, early childhood is birth through second grade, actually. Um, and we have to have a comprehensive conversation about the entire system and stop pulling it apart to try to address uh, just individual things. Um, and the last thing that I think is critical is actually looking at not just comparing workforce and saying, well, this group is making this and another group is making another amount, but really truly looking at the work and remembering that early childhood does set the foundation for future learning. Um, teachers have to be certified. Assistant teachers also have to have a certain level of education and that needs to be compensated in a respectful um, and professional way that I think that we've missed the mark on a little. So the next administration has an opportunity to really look at that in a meaningful way and remember 2020 when the city, the state, the world shut down, the educators were still going. They were still making phone calls. They were still connecting people to resources. They were still working to advocate for technology in places that didn't have infrastructure. They kept going. So don't forget that conversation when you're talking about making things whole. It's really hard to talk about expansion when the existing system is being pulled apart. So we need to really regroup and restart the conversation in a different way. I wanna to turn to Janine. You mentioned that you were just praying that your son gets uh, a spot with SYEP, the Summer Youth Employment Program, which provides paid internships to, to students. If he doesn't, what are your plans? What other options do you have? So we applied for some volunteering opportunities and stuff that he would have been, would be able to do regardless. But honestly, you know, this is making me miss, um, good shepherd services and stuff like that because you know at least once i know they're they're having program i can put them in but honestly i don't know what to say to do what what what, what plans i have for him the borders is closed so i can't even you know let him take a trip you know nothing there's nothing that i really have planned that's why it's like it didn't really hit me until i just listened I know when he signed, when we signed up, it said lottery. And I know what a lottery means, but it didn't hit me just until just now, like, hold up. This is a real issue that I can be dealing with. And I don't have a backup plan, like a solid backup plan because my son has plans. He has plans with his money <laughs> already. And I'm sure other children other 14 year olds, first timers, who who's who did that application, they have plans as well. So I don't know. Yeah, that's tough to think about. Um, I'll join you in your prayers. Um, so Madison, I want to turn to you. Um, so the experts of uh, the experiences of being in a school, of being in after school, of being in summer school, the students are the experts. So I want to hear from you. What's the best way that we can get input from young people? How can we make sure that we're listening to feedback and acting on that feedback while all of these plans are being made for um, summer school, after school, all of those programs? Um, definitely, yeah, because our voices need to be heard. We're the ones that are attending the summer camp, summer schools, and after schools. Mainly, I would say, like, even calls like this, because we all know we cannot get in a room together, but even calls like this make a difference, because you're speaking and you are sharing your opinion on something and overall like I've had um experience with um rallies but like in person and um even protesting um 
So that was really fun. That honestly, I mean, well, it's not fun because you have to protest for something, but just being active and like just like the arts and crafts of like writing on posters, like we need this, we need this, and speaking, having a chance to speak, because I feel like as students, we feel like we're looked less upon just because we are children, but that we're the main focus. So I feel like if we understand and a lot of, and that's the thing, because I may know about this, but there's a whole bunch of other children and students that have no clue. So we need more resources to just even reach out and to let someone know you have a voice and you need to use it. And overall, just to be heard, because we can speak all we want, but if we're not heard and it's not getting anywhere, it's going to get tiring after time. Um, overall, just feeling like we matter. We matter. Our voices matter and we can make a difference. We have the potential to make a difference. So overall, just letting us know that we have a voice. And like I said, even if we can't get in person right now, there's always a way. There is always a way and we can figure out a way and make a way to spread our message. Can you think of a time or a person who made you feel like like you matter and like you could come to these things and speak up? Who who was it or what was it that really motivated you? Overall, I'm going to say Good Shepherd Services, the after school. I have gotten so many opportunities from there. I can't, and I was just talking to um a teacher from my school today and I was like I have gotten so many opportunities from Good Shepherd and I would hear like I, ha I can have friends from other schools and you're like you have that in your after school what I don't have like it's a whole big thing and I'm like I think I thought that was normal but Good Shepherd definitely I've gotten a chance to host um a, a salsa congress twice in a row co-host a rally I did in the summer a virtual class for salsa with students and we had a whole green screen and everything and I want to shout out to um Mr. Gary and all of them and I forgot actually the building name but I went there um during the summer and they were open arms that that best feeling ever to know that like you said we can depend on something that is permanent and stable and to know like they were even telling me you want to start your own dance club you want to start a feminist club you want to start a theater club come here because we'll make it work and just knowing that you have a voice and what it can come to fruition if you want something to happen it can happen so overall just having a voice and like I said, arts and crafts, expressing yourself, you feel like you matter if you're expressing yourself through, we had musicals in summer school, a musical, there's theater, um, singing, dance, you name it, arts and crafts, everything. And you feel like it's teamwork. It is teamwork and you feel like you matter. So overall, just programs that we know that we can depend on and can make things happen and make us feel um open and make us feel comfortable overall yeah thank you for sharing sharing all that we are getting very close to the end here um so i want to squeeze in very quickly maybe one or two more um we've got a comment uh from mark again about salary parity lots about salary parity who says salary parity is critical, but we must include special education preschools and state approved school age special education schools. Um, as the New York City Education Department has rejected these students from traditional 3K, 4K and school aged students without salary parity for all of these schools, the city will continue to discriminate against disabled students. Um, and we also have a comment about, um, which I think is important in the pay parity Discussion uh, question from Lynn who says, I noticed that Janine was applauding when Michelle mentioned loan forgiveness. Can Janine or any of the panelists share their thoughts on why loan forgiveness is important? And this is interesting because when you talk to teachers who are in the classroom, um, 
who maybe don't have their degrees yet or aren't certified, like a lot of them have, are working towards it and have been working towards it for a long time, but guess what? They're working full time and oh, guess what? They're not making a whole lot of money while doing it. And so it feels like for a lot of them that they're like on this hamster wheel. Um, and so I don't know if, um, if Michelle or Betty, if you guys wanna discuss, um, discuss these issues. Um, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the early childhood, early childhood workforce is underpaid, full stop. But they are required to have the same certifications, especially for teachers in particular, to retain their jobs. And that means that they have to have full certification, including a master's degree. And this is really difficult to achieve when you're not making the money that you should. So that means that you have to take out a loan. So it's just a, a vicious cycle of underpaid, you may only be able to take three credits at a time. So it's taking you longer to complete. Um, and then you have to take out a loan to essentially retain your job. That's what it comes down to. So when we're having discussions about full compensation, we need to talk about the most vulnerable folks in the workforce and how the dedication and drive to stay with this, to stay in early childhood settings and community-based organizations, the dedication to actually make yourself financially vulnerable by taking out a loan so that you, you could stay in your communities and work with the communities. There should be some type of compensation. Um, and I think loan forgiveness is something that doesn't get um, spoken about enough, especially for the workforce. It wouldn't be a Zoom uh, uh, some, uh, convening if somebody didn't talk without muting themselves. And of course I did that. I talked without unmuting myself, um, but we made it almost to the very end before I did that. Um, I think that's all of our time. I wanna thank everyone for sharing about their experiences. It's so important to know, you know what the reality on the ground is and what's needed um, from the people who are using, benefiting, could benefit from these services. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Thank you to the panelists for lending your deep knowledge and insights. Um, I wanna remind everyone to please head over to Chalkbeat and check out our election coverage and all of our schools coverage. Uh, I focus specifically on early childhood issues as well as a whole host of others. Um, but please send me your ideas, your thoughts. You can even yell at me if I've written something that you don't like or don't agree with. Um, I will listen, uh, I promise. Um, and so we also want to make sure that everyone goes out and votes, please. Um, so I think we're going to share some information on the screen with you guys about, about that and check your voter registration. Make sure you know when the key dates are. Um, learn a little bit about ranked choice. And thank you. Let's keep the conversation going. You know how to reach us. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you.